Hi, Mike here. This episode contains a little strong language. It was probably the most infamous murder trial in New Zealand's history, 1971. A South Auckland farmer named Arthur Allen Thomas was found guilty of killing his neighbours, Harvey and Jeanette Crewe. Both victims had been shot through the head with a .22 calibre bullet. On November the 11th, Arthur Allen Thomas was charged with murder. If you're a New Zealander, you've almost certainly heard of this case. The country was consumed by it. Thomas was tried a second time, convicted again, and then sensationally released from prison and officially pardoned. The uh, pardon has been approved and Thomas, his parents, have been notified of the pardon. A Royal Commission of Inquiry found the police had planted evidence to incriminate him. What you might not know is that the inquiry was nearly thrown out after an all-out war between the judge in charge, a guy called Justice Robert Taylor, and the lawyers for the police. Taylor was a gruff Australian. He would snap at the lawyers for the police, telling them to sit down when they tried to object, and even suggested that officers giving evidence were lying. The police lawyers did not like this, and it led to some pretty serious clashes. Things got so bad that at one point, Taylor said the lead counsel, John Henry QC, was, quote, thick in the head. With that, Henry and his team walked out. Soon after, papers were filed in the High Court asking for the commissioners to be dismissed on the grounds that Justice Taylor was biased. What began here today was virtually legal proceedings to inquire into legal proceedings, and it looks like being a very complex battle of legal wits. On the one side, asking the court to intervene, are the police unions. They maintain that the Thomas Royal Commission is not being conducted in a fair and proper manner and want the High Court to step in. So what does all this have to do with our story, the Air New Zealand plane that crashed into Mount Erebus? Well, watching the Thomas Commission unfold was Justice Peter Mann, who was leading the Erebus inquiry. The two commissions were running at the same time. The reason Mann was paying close attention was because he had a similar problem to Justice Taylor. He was having a hard time believing some of the evidence he was hearing from Air New Zealand about why the crash was the pilot's fault and not the airline's. Mann later wrote that there was, quote, an air of profound disbelief in the room as some of the evidence was given. He didn't fancy being sued like Justice Taylor had been. That action failed, by the way. But one day, when the commission was adjourned, Mann had a quiet word in his chambers with one of Air New Zealand's lawyers. Mann told him that maybe he could let his client know that some of its evidence wasn't coming across very well. And so Mann left it at that. Satisfied he'd given Air New Zealand plenty of warning about its problems, but he kept himself above the fray. In fact, this decision to have a discreet meeting was the beginning of the end of Peter Mann's career as a judge. He just didn't know it yet. I'm Katie Gossett. And I'm Michael Wright. From Stuff and RNZ, this is White Silence, a podcast about the Erebus disaster. Elizabeth and I were both interested to know where he was going to go the next day. He didn't mention any of us. The description I heard in this court was so different to my recollection that I wondered if, in fact, I had attended the same briefing. It's a woeful story, isn't it? It's not a good story. Episode 3, All Hell. It was supposed to be a simple job. When Peter Mann opened the Erebus Commission in July 1980, he thought it would take a couple of months. He'd read the Chippendale report, which mostly blamed the pilot, and figured he would more or less rubber stamp it and move on. Instead, it became a monster. Two bitterly opposed sides emerged and the evidence dragged on and on. Mann's deadline to report back to the government was October, but he had to extend that four times to hear everything. When it was finally over, it was 1981. There had been more than 50 witnesses, nearly 300 exhibits, and more than 3,000 pages of evidence. Now, a royal commission isn't a trial. 
There's no prosecution or defence or verdict. But anyone watching the Erebus Commission could have been forgiven for thinking that's exactly what it was. It was held in a big boardroom at the Auckland Regional Council offices on Hobson Street. Justice Mann, white-haired and lantern-jawed, sat at a long raised bench above rows of lawyers at tables covered in paper. There was a witness box on his right and a public gallery at the back. When Mann walked into the room, everyone stood up. The only things missing were some wigs and the regalia. Other than that, it looked just like a courtroom. And inevitably in a court, battle lines get drawn. On one side was Air New Zealand and the Civil Aviation Division, the old government air safety watchdog. They argued the crash was the pilot's fault for flying too low without being certain of their position. On the other side were the lawyers for the estates of those pilots and the pilots' union, known as the Airline Pilots Association, or ALPA. They said Captain Jim Collins and First Officer Greg Casson had been badly misled by the airline and shouldn't be blamed for anything. This episode is about the Royal Commission, the evidence that was heard and how it became a partisan battlefield. But if we tried to tell you about all of it, even just to summarise it, we'd be here for days. The transcript of everything that was said is nearly 2,000 pages long, and despite the bitter dispute we just laid out, a lot of it is really boring. Long, convoluted questions that sound like... That 771 b requires a demonstration to the operator... ...with answers that sound like... Air New Zealand corrected the shortcomings in the route clearance unit and asked for a further appraisal of the unit. The Erebus story is complicated enough without making you listen to all of that. So instead, we're going to focus on three key areas of evidence. One of those was the altitude that the Air New Zealand flights flew in Antarctica. This came up on the very first day of the commission. The first witness was Ron Chippendale, the Chief Air Accident Investigator. You'll remember him from the last episode. His report on the crash pointed the finger at the pilot. The report says the probable cause of the accident was the decision of the Air New Zealand captain, Jim Collins, to continue the tourist flight at low level in poor visibility, when the crew were not certain of their position. At the commission, Chippendale was asked about reports that a week or so before the crash, an aircraft had been seen flying at a thousand feet above some glaciers in Antarctica. It was never confirmed if this was an Air New Zealand plane, but the rumour had made its way to the airline because a thousand feet was really low, way under the minimum safe altitudes that Air New Zealand had set for its Antarctic flights, 16,000 feet and one tiny area of 6,000 feet. This was supposed to keep the planes clear of the mountains in McMurdo Sound. But the fatal flight had crashed into Mount Erebus at 1,500 feet, well below those MSAs. Now, that sounds bad for Jim Collins, but it soon emerged that this sort of low flying happened all the time. Other Antarctic flights had gone as low as 3,000 or even 2,000 feet, and the pilots who kept in those flights told the Commission that those altitude rules weren't really rules. Here's Captain Les Simpson, who piloted the flight two weeks before the crash. 6,000 was an altitude below which flight was prohibited. I would expect it to be stated more in the terms that 6,000 feet is the lowest permitted altitude. However, this left the 6,000 as a rather loose term. Simpson said that it was pretty much up to a pilot and air traffic control to work out between themselves what was a safe altitude. He gave the example of flying into Christchurch Airport from Hokitika on the west coast. For most of that approach, Simpson said there was an MSA, remember everyone called them MSAs, an MSA of just under 10,000 feet. But on a fine day when any mountains would be easy to see, air traffic control might clear you as low as 3,000 feet. Something similar applied in Antarctica. The air traffic control down there was run by the Americans at McMurdo Station. If conditions were good and the Americans were OK with it, then going under 16,000 feet was fine. And this low flying wasn't exactly a secret. Here's a journalist writing about it in the Central Leader in November 1978. We seem almost to hang over frozen land, and at 2,000 feet we're low enough to see huts and vehicles clearly, yet high enough for passengers to be comfortable flying a mountainous land. Another account appeared in the airline's own Air New Zealand News. The DC-10 cruised at 2,000 feet past Mount Erebus and over the Great Ice Plateau. 
The old Auckland newspaper, 8 o'clock, had one at 1,300 feet. The Auckland Star, 650 feet. On they went. One article even had the airline's then director of flight operations waxing lyrical about how great the view was from such a low altitude. But the one that really mattered, as far as the Royal Commission was concerned, was one that appeared in a magazine called The Travelling Times in September 1978. It was written by a guy called John Brizendine. Brizendine was the president of the McDonnell Douglas Corporation, which made DC-10s. He was also a friend of Air New Zealand chief executive Maury Davis and a guest of the airline on an Antarctic flight in 1977. Brizendine enjoyed his trip so much, he wrote a story about it and had it sent to Davis. That article, which, as you might have guessed, also spoke about low flying, had a vast print run. Travelling Times was published by an Air New Zealand subsidiary, and the plan was to send a copy to every household in the country. Maury Davis said he never read it. Not when it was sent directly to him, not when, presumably, a copy was sent to his house like everyone else. Davis was an old-fashioned boss who preferred talking to writing things down, so it wasn't beyond belief that he wouldn't read his own mail. But Mann didn't buy it. When Davis took the stand, the judge tried, in vain, to get some answers. Were you made aware, Mr Davis, of the arrangements to distribute throughout New Zealand a copy of Mr Brizendine's article contained in the Travelling Times? No, sir. Well, evidently, um, there were a million copies printed, and they all referred, of course, to the Senate flight of 3,000 feet. Yes. The only difficulty is that there's not one executive pilot who's testified who will agree that he ever heard anything about them flying under 6,000 feet. I know this. And yet, the airline itself was a party to the distribution of a million pamphlets advertising that very fact. Yes. However, you didn't know anything about that. No. No, sir. You heard Mann say there that none of the executive pilots, pilots who flew planes and had some management position, claimed to know anything about low flying. This was true. Most of them gave evidence early at the commission and they put up a remarkably united front. Then, one day, after the commission had been running for a couple of months, the facade was broken. Captain John Wilson, who wasn't an executive pilot but was a pretty senior guy, said he knew some of the flights had gone low, well under 6,000 feet. He'd heard other people in the office talking about it. This was a crucial admission, because Wilson was one of two men who ran the briefings that all Antarctic pilots had to attend before their flights. And if the guy who's prepping the pilots thinks it's OK, well, maybe the pilots will too. I remember remarking in passing at some of my Antarctic briefings that I was aware that some flights had been below 6,000 feet. I assumed it had been done with the prior authority of air traffic controller at McMurdo. What Wilson's talking about there is basically what you heard Les Simpson say before. If air traffic control was OK with it, you're all good. Straight after Wilson on the stand came Captain Ross Johnson. He was the manager in charge of the Antarctic flights, and he ran the Antarctic flight simulator training for the pilots. Johnson told the commission no, 6,000 feet was the minimum, no exceptions. But with his next breath, he admitted to one of the lawyers that he'd broken that very rule himself when he flew an Antarctic flight back in 1977. Is it common for Air New Zealand pilots to disobey restrictions imposed by Air New Zealand? Uh, I would not believe so, but... Uh, Have you done it before? Uh, no, I had not, uh, not knowingly. Uh, well, why then on this occasion did you yourself disobey a restriction? That is something of which I'm not, uh, certainly not proud. You might have gathered from all this that the altitude evidence, particularly when it came to those MSAs, was not good for Air New Zealand. It showed the airline management was, at best, astonishingly ignorant of what was going on and giving mixed messages about whether the MSAs were rules or guidelines. At worst, they were lying, pretending they had no idea what was going on to help shift the blame for the crash to the pilot, Jim Collins. And you might also have gathered that by this point, Air New Zealand had split into two very clear sides. It was management versus the workers, and the divisions ran deep. There was a them and this. It started right from the beginning, and it was started by the company. That's Arthur Cooper from the last episode. He was one of the pilots who transcribed the black box recording from the crash. He was also a union guy. He sat through the commission as an observer. You had the, the councils, Lloyd Brown, etc., for the company, 
and they were sitting there and they had the comfortable chairs and then the people like myself were down the back on a stool sort of thing. Now, Lloyd Brown was a QC and the lead counsel for Air New Zealand, which is probably why he had a nicer chair than Arthur Cooper, who was watching from the gallery. Brown was also a good friend of Peter Mann's. On the Friday late afternoons when it was finished, someone would have drinks down in their chambers and we were always invited along. You'd have a few drinks and then go home. But no one from the company team would be at those. They were completely separate. But it wasn't just a matter of who had nicer chairs and who was going to whose Friday drinks. The division spilled into the hearings as well. That was the part of the adversarial nature of the Royal Commission. This is Kim Murray. In 1980, he was a junior lawyer at the Commission for the Civil Aviation Division, and he watched as the warring sides made life difficult for each other. It became very difficult for counsel assisting to get hold of briefs of evidence in advance. This was not normal. Usually, at an inquiry like this, everyone gets to see beforehand what each other's witnesses will say, so they can work out what to question them on. Witnesses would go into the witness box and their written evidence would be handed out at the same time. The witness would read the brief of evidence and then be subject to cross-examination by counsel who may not have been as fully prepared as, as if they'd had the briefs of evidence in advance. Now, Murray said this was at least in part down to the pressures of this particular commission. There was a ton of evidence and a ton of information to organise, but the end result was each side was basically making it as hard as possible for the other to interrogate their witnesses. It was a very intense procedure that went on for a long time and was very adversarial at times and intense. Milton Wiley, Ron Chippendale's investigator from episode two. He was at the commission as well. He watched on in a kind of awe. The pilots here are this group and the company's this group over here. And they were at sort of loggerheads. So, I mean, it's hard to believe that they were actually the same outfit. I mean, <laughs> they're all on the same team. I can't understand. The two sides even argued about the weather in McMurdo Sound at the time of the crash. We touched on this last episode when we talked about clear air whiteout. Remember, this is what is thought to have happened after Jim Collins took the plane down under a low bank of cloud, just north of Erebus. Light then bounced off the white cloud above and the white sea ice below to blur the horizon and trick the flight crew into thinking that there was flat terrain ahead, instead of a mountain. The pilots' union backed this theory and laid into Air New Zealand. It said the airline knew about this type of whiteout but didn't tell the pilots. Air New Zealand admitted they'd been told about it back when they were first looking into Antarctic flights, but hadn't really appreciated how dangerous it was. This argument did not go down well. Here's Milton Wiley again. The big problem was they never utilised the expertise they had. Those people who've operated down there on the Herks, who work for the company, they had that experience. And they could have said that you get below that cloud cover, it's bad business because the light bounces around. Air New Zealand hit back though, claiming that maybe the weather around Ross Island that day wasn't actually very good. Now there wasn't a heap of evidence to support this. A couple of meteorologists testified that the cloud was getting thicker and lower and the plane may even have been flying in and out of it the closer it got to Erebus. And a Kiwi who had been on an American chopper that landed near Erebus about an hour after the crash said it was snowing by then. But that was about it. Forty years later, this is a sore point for at least two other men who were there. Yeah, the name's Ted Robinson. This is Ted Robinson, an ex-cop who in the summer of 1979 was the deputy leader of Scott Base. A lot of his job back then was working the radio, and he would often be the one who picked up the call when an Air New Zealand flight was in the area. The pilots would actually want to talk to Scott Base or want to talk to McMurdo. This was a bit of a gimmick on the Antarctic flights. The pilots would get Scott Base on the radio, then patch them through to the PA system on the plane so the passengers could listen. Uh, 901, 901, this is Scott Base, how copy? Uh, Scott Base from 901, go. Cue a bit of back and forth. How's it going down there? We're having a good time. Weather OK? It's a very, very nice day indeed. And, uh, not a cloud in the sky and temperatures getting up towards uh, zero Celsius. A couple of dad jokes. You must be having a heat wave almost with those temperatures. 
sorry we can't drop you a newspaper. Classic. The main reason for the call, though, was because the pilots wanted to know exactly what the conditions were like around Scott Base and McMurdo Station. Both were highlights of the sightseeing trip, so they wanted to get there if they possibly could. The audio you just heard was from the flight on November the 21st, 1979, a week before the crash. And the weather that day was, as you heard, almost perfect. Light winds, cloudless sky. But when Jim Collins radioed a week later, Ted Robinson gave him a different story. I just advised him it was complete whiteout conditions and not to come anywhere near Ross Island. Complete whiteout conditions. And by whiteout, Robinson isn't talking about the clear air whiteout we just covered. He means straight up bad weather, where you literally can't see anything and you know you can't see anything. Everything just looks like a straight sheet of ice or snow. There was no wind or anything like that. It was just the fog, you might say, came down and you've got no surface definition whatsoever. Ted Robinson was at Scott Base when he told Collins the weather was no good, right at the southern tip of Ross Island. Mount Erebus and the crash site, they're both right in the middle of the island, more than 20 miles north. But Robinson knew the conditions there couldn't have been much good either. He'd tried to radio that American chopper with the Kiwi on board, but couldn't because it had been grounded by bad weather. It would be years after the Royal Commission before anyone heard his story. I couldn't understand why I was never asked, because there's a lot of information that never came through. Robinson isn't alone here. Keith Woodford, the mountaineer we met in episode one, he was never asked to testify either. He was on the west side of McMurdo Sound that day, where it was sunny, and he could see the cloud over Ross Island. People with key knowledge hadn't been called. Why wasn't Ted Robinson called? Why wasn't Keith Woodford called? That day was not clear weather on Erebus. It was bloody thick cloud. All they had to do is ask people who were there Woodford even wrote a letter to the Commission because he felt so strongly about some of the evidence. And Milton Wiley? He'd worked on the cockpit voice recording and gathered all the evidence from the other black box on the aircraft, the one with the flight information on it. Crucial details about the flight path, speed, altitude. But Mann didn't ask him to testify on any of it. Why did he refuse to take any evidence from me? Well, I heard evidence from every man and his dog who happened to be around. I could have explained that whole thing to him, but he didn't want to know. But back to Ted Robinson. His story raises one big question. Jim Collins was flying straight at Ross Island, and Robinson had told him that the weather there was no good. So why did Collins keep going? Not only that, why did he take the plane down to 1,500 feet? Why would he do that if he knew there was bad weather and a 13,000-foot mountain ahead. I don't think he was intending to come over there. I think he was intending to come well away from Erebus. There was a lot of things like that where you'd think, what the f***? From Stuff, a new 12-part documentary podcast. He was into sex every day. The Commune. Sex, drugs, and a guru called Bert. There are crimes, but this isn't a who done it. It's a why done it. Good God, adults agreed to this? The Commune. Find it now on your favourite podcast platform or at stuff.co.nz slash the commune. You've already been welcome to Centre Point. And this is the final thing we're talking about, the flight path. Again, it's something we touched on in the last episode, so hopefully it rings a bell. This was the change in one of the coordinates on the route the night before the fatal flight. That change shifted the final leg of the flight from a path that went down the middle of McMurdo Sound, i.e. over the sea into the west of Mount Erebus, to a flight path directly over Erebus. You might also remember that this came up in the Chippendale report. That's the one that blamed the pilots for the crash. In that report, it emerged that the route was supposed to go over Erebus all along. It was moved to the west by mistake, then moved back again without anyone telling the pilots, Collins and Casson. But what almost no one outside of Air New Zealand knew was the staggering series of mistakes that had to be made for all of this to happen. The whole sorry saga unfolded when the airline's chief navigator, Brian Hewitt, took the stand at the commission. You swear by Almighty God, the evidence you have to give before the commission, so either truth, the whole truth, or nothing but the truth? I do. 
Hewitt's story starts in 1977, when no one knew if Air New Zealand's Antarctic flights would be a success or just a one-off. Back then, the flight path went over Mount Erebus, and the final waypoint, where the plane turned around and headed back north, was at Williams Field. That's the ice runway near McMurdo Station and Scott Base. It's only a couple of miles away from both of them. In late 77, the waypoint was moved from Williams Field to a radio beacon in the area. The following year, more Antarctic flights were approved and they were starting to look like a regular thing. So Air New Zealand formalised them a bit by putting the flight plan into the company computer. To do this, one of Brian Hewitt's jobs was entering the coordinates of each waypoint along the route, so a latitude and a longitude for each one. But when he did this, he made two mistakes. First, he used the original Williams Field waypoint instead of the new one at the radio beacon, so wrong by a couple of miles, which isn't actually that big a deal. But then, when Hewitt keyed in that Williams Field waypoint, he made a typo. Instead of typing a longitude of 166.48 degrees, he typed 164.48 degrees. By hitting 4 instead of 6, Hewitt inadvertently moved that waypoint by about 27 miles from a point at the southern tip of Ross Island to a random spot west of that, in the middle of McMurdo Sound. Once Hewitt made this mistake, no one noticed. He didn't pick it up when he checked his numbers, and the error stayed in the flight plan through all the 1978 flights and into the 79 ones. And hopefully this is all now flooding back to you from the last episode. The main reason for this was because once the flights got to Antarctica, the weather was almost always good so the pilots veered off course to check out the sights. They never actually flew to the final waypoint to see where it was. That all changed after the Antarctic flight of November the 14th, 1979. That was flown by Captain Les Simpson, who you've already heard talking about the altitude rules. Les Simpson plays a crucial role in this part of the story, so we're going to step away from Brian Hewitt for a minute and focus on Simpson's testimony. Now, quick heads up. This is also the most complicated part of our story, so if there was ever a time to really concentrate, it's now. If you don't quite follow this, go to the White Silence page on the Stuff or RNZ websites. There's an explainer of all of this there. OK, so Les Simpson, Jim Collins and Greg Casson and a couple of other pilots all attended the same briefing for their Antarctic flights on November the 9th, 1979. At the briefing, there was a copy of an Antarctic flight path on a table. And this flight path had Brian Hewitt's typo in it. Any of the pilots could look at it, and several of them did, including Simpson. He told the commission that when he did this, he looked at the coordinates for the destination waypoint and made a mental note that it was out in the water, well to the west of the whole McMurdo Station Scott Base area. He guessed the distance at about 10 miles. When Simpson got down to the ice a few days later, the weather was really good, so he deviated from the flight path to give his passengers a look at some of the sights. Then he headed over to McMurdo Station and Scott Base, and as he got near, he was, quote, somewhat surprised to see the cockpit computer telling him he was more than 20 miles away from the destination waypoint. This was quite a bit more than the rough 10-mile estimate he'd made earlier. Initially, Simpson thought there might be something wrong with the computer, but he double-checked and the computer was right. The waypoint was about 27 miles west of McMurdo Station. The irony here is that Simpson had actually picked up on Brian Hewitt's typo, the 164 instead of 166. He just didn't know it. He was just surprised that his guesstimate was so low. And this was the start of that fateful final change to the flight path. Because when Simpson got back to New Zealand, he made a call to Captain Ross Johnson, who was in charge of the Antarctic flights, and who you also heard from earlier in the altitude evidence. During that call, Simpson said he told Johnson about this disparity that he'd been surprised that McMurdo Station was so far from that destination waypoint, 27 miles. He suggested to Johnson that other crews should be told about this, so they weren't taken aback like he was. It wasn't a huge deal to Simpson, it wasn't even the main reason he called Johnson, but he did think it was worth mentioning. Ross Johnson had a very different recollection of this phone call. Yes, he told the Commission, Les Simpson did bring up the location of the McMurdo waypoint, but... All he said was that he thought it should be changed to the site of a new radio beacon. One of the lawyers asked Johnson, don't you remember Captain Simpson saying something about being off course? Not in specific miles or a magnitude. Did Simpson refer to any disparity at all? I don't recall him doing so. 
do you not recall him telling you that he had been surprised that the distance was about 27 miles? No, I do not, and I would have been very surprised to have heard that myself. So, Johnson said the next thing he did, after this phone call where Les Simpson didn't mention any details, was call navigation section. Johnson said he asked them to check for any problems with the flight path. But the two navigators who did this, one of them was Brian Hewitt, didn't actually check Simpson's real-world flight path. They checked an old version of the route, which still showed the original destination waypoint of Williams Field. That version didn't have Hewitt's typo in it, so they were never going to pick it up. What they did, though, with Johnson's approval, was decide that this Williams Field waypoint should be tweaked, that it would be better if it was placed at the site of a new radio beacon just a couple of miles away. It was sort of tidier to have the official waypoint plonked precisely on the location of a beacon that pilots were already using for other navigational reasons. And so, as you might have worked out by now, the navigators thought they were moving the destination waypoint by a couple of miles, basically nothing, so no need to tell the pilots. Keith Ames, another one of Air New Zealand's navigators, laid this out pretty well at the commission. If I had seen Captain Collins that morning, I probably would have just said to him, even in passing, well, Jim, there's been a couple of miles change it won't make any difference to the flight plan. Nobody knew that there was a 27-mile change. That last part is crucial. Air New Zealand's entire explanation for how this mistake happened was that nobody realised that their two-and-a-half-mile change was actually a 27-mile change. If they had known, it would have been unforgivable not to tell the pilots. Watching on, Justice Mahn called it a remarkable sequence of errors. And he was right. In one excruciating exchange... Paul Davison, the lawyer for the estate of Jim Collins, took Brian Hewitt through all of the mistakes, one by one. This is a recreation from a TV documentary. You have told us you inadvertently pushed the wrong key. You agree that was an error or omission? That was an error. Failure by your section to pick the error in the McMurdo position. That was an error, was it not? That was an omission. All these errors... And in a company which in its nav section tells us we are dealing with people who check and cross-check and never assume anything. It's a woeful story, isn't it? It's not a good story. I suggest to you, for people whose job it is to be precise, it's a woeful story. That is your opinion, sir. Now, if things were already pretty bad between Air New Zealand management and the pilots, this was the point in the commission where they completely fell apart. By now, it was late November 1980. What brought matters to a head was the evidence about that infamous briefing three weeks before the crash. That was the one where Les Simpson said he learned the route for the Antarctic flights was down the middle of McMurdo Sound. The other two surviving pilots who attended said the same. The men who ran the briefing, that's Ross Johnson and John Wilson, who we mentioned earlier, they said no we definitely told the pilots that the route went over Mount Erebus. John Wilson was unequivocal on this point. At no time did I say anything other than the aircraft overflies Mount Erebus. Both sides couldn't be right. Les Simpson had a theory about why this was. He and the other pilots only heard the briefing once. Johnson and Wilson gave it several times. Possibly... Unconsciously, each time they demonstrated, they inadvertently improved it somewhat. Simpson was saying that it wasn't that Wilson and Johnson were lying, more that they'd convinced themselves that they'd said things they hadn't. Wilson's evidence, Simpson said, he didn't have a massive problem with. Johnson's evidence, however... The description I heard in this court was so different to my recollection that I wondered if, in fact, I had attended the same briefing. From here on, it was pretty much daggers drawn between Air New Zealand management and the union. Justice Mann called it sustained hostility. It was about this time that he met the Air New Zealand lawyer in his chambers to pass on his concerns that some of the airline's evidence was looking a bit sketchy, a decision that would cost him dearly. Arthur Cooper was also bothered by what he heard. Remember, Cooper was a union guy and pro-Collins, 
but he was also an Air New Zealand employee, and he had no desire to see the company become a laughingstock. The case for the company was getting, shall we say, fractured. It was starting to become a bit of a joke. Cooper and a colleague decided to go and see their boss, Chief Executive Maury Davis. Cooper wanted to warn Davis that the company was looking bad and also suggest that he send someone to attend the hearing every day and keep Davis updated. The problem was I, I couldn't get the message over. As soon as I started to say something, Murray was tired of, look, there's big games being played here, boy, sort of thing. Cooper thinks Davis was hinting at just how high the stakes were here. Air New Zealand was a government-owned airline and it could be on the hook for a whole lot of money if it ended up taking the rap for the crash. That was why Davis wasn't interested in what he had to say. After 40 minutes, <laughs> I never got the message across. And so we left there and uh, I said to Pete Rose, I said, what did you think of that? And he said it was like a nightmare. <laughs> Davis's response wasn't a one-off. He could be abrasive, especially with the media. He was short and stocky, with thick black hair, and he wore glasses with dark, chunky frames. The actor Ian Mune, who would later play him on screen, once said looking at Davis was like looking down the barrel of a gun. So when the chief executive took the stand as the very last witness at the commission, he doubled down and delivered an impassioned defence of the company he had worked for since he was 16. I believe that the planning that went into the Antarctic operation was appropriate to the mission that we had in mind. Some errors occurred. I cannot accept that the company planning activity in the matter of the operation, in principle, was inadequate for the task. You might be thinking at this point that all this is sounding pretty bad for Air New Zealand. And yeah, that's fair. But it's not the end of the story. Because while Air New Zealand had made some serious mistakes, all that evidence still had to be put into the context of the crash. At the end of the commission, the last thing the lawyers did was present their final submissions, sort of like closing arguments, and they all hinged on one question. Did Jim Collins do the right thing? Air New Zealand said no, and their reasons for this boiled down to those three areas of evidence we looked at. Altitude, weather, coordinate change. Now, sorry for butting in here, but to tell you about what Air New Zealand said in closing and what the other side counted with, we need to tell you about one more slightly complicated thing. Much was made during the commission of the fact that Jim Collins was flying VMC when the plane crashed. Collins said this on the black box transcript over and over again. VMC stands for Visual Meteorological Conditions, and it basically means that you are flying using your eyes. It means the weather conditions, especially visibility, are good enough that you don't need to rely on your instruments to know where you're going. You can find your way by looking out the window and seeing what's there. When Antarctic pilots deviated from the flight path to check out the sights, they were flying VMC when they did that. The rule on the Antarctic flights was 20 miles visibility to fly VMC, and if you wanted to go low, go under that 16,000 foot altitude rule, you had to be flying visually. You had to be VMC. Now, on Les Simpson's flight, that was no problem. The weather was almost perfect. But Jim Collins, as we know from the weather evidence, was flying toward a thick bank of cloud. And the black box transcript showed that as he approached that cloud, he radioed the American air traffic control at McMurdo Station and was told that conditions were cloud down to 2,000 feet, some snow showers, but otherwise good visibility of 40 miles. OK, got that? Now let's go back to Air New Zealand. They argued that after Jim Collins got that weather update, he made a crucial mistake. While flying VMC, he assumed he knew where he was, instead of being certain of where he was. Here's how that happened. As well as giving Collins a weather update, the American Air Traffic Control said to him, you can come down to an altitude of 1,500 feet, if you like, on a radar letdown. This meant that air traffic control would use radar to get a lock on the plane and monitor the descent, so it knew exactly where the plane was the whole time. The pilots were pleased about this. It was basically a free escort, so they said, yes, we accept your offer. On the black box, Collins even said something like, that's what we want to hear. The radar letdown never happened. Radar works on line of sight, so if you're a pilot and you want a radar lock and there's something in between you and the radar, you won't get a connection. 
and the closer the plane got to Ross Island, the bigger an obstacle Mount Erebus became. Line of sight affected the radio as well. For almost the entire last half hour of the flight, the plane was talking to air traffic control on HF radio. HF radio doesn't need line of sight to work, but the pilots were trying to make contact on the better quality VHF radio, which does. But they couldn't get a connection because, again, Mount Erebus was in the way. Air New Zealand said this should have been a red flag. Collins and Casson should have been asking themselves, why won't these things work? And realised the reason might be that they weren't where they thought they were. Even Arthur Cooper concedes this possibility. I went through with the, the CBR, the corporate voice recorder, and every time something was done, I put myself in that position and I could say, can I fault that in any way? And I couldn't, right through. It could not fault anything. The only question would be when they got broken up on the VHF, it could have gelled something, say, shit, this isn't right, this is not working out. So without radar or VHF radio, if Jim Collins wanted to go below 16,000 feet, he had to do it himself, VMC. And that was what he did. He told air traffic control, I'm VMC and I'm descending. Air traffic control said fine. If Jim Collins was flying visually, no problem. He can see where he's going. So Collins took the plane down. This was about 15 minutes before impact. He had to keep clear of the gathering cloud to stay VMC, so he did a couple of 360s as he descended, then turned back to the south when he was low enough to get under the cloud at 2,000 feet. Then he pulled a knob in the cockpit for nav select, which, for us amateurs, basically means a kind of autopilot. It tells the plane to follow the flight path programmed into the computer. You probably know where this is going. Jim Collins, just like Les Simpson and every other pilot who attended that infamous briefing, must have believed his flight path took him down the middle of McMurdo Sound, west of Ross Island. That was why he pulled the nav select knob to lock onto that route. In fact, he was heading directly at Ross Island and into a clear air whiteout with the illusion of nothing but flat terrain ahead of him. Air New Zealand said that was bad airmanship. Quote, It is fundamental to any descent below MSA that a pilot is required first to be certain of his position. And if you're flying VMC, certainty is not, I was briefed that my flight path went down the middle of McMurdo Sound. Certainty, under VMC, means seeing an obstacle, like a mountain, with your own eyes and not flying into it. Here's Milton Wiley again. They put themselves in a situation. What do we used to say about... uh, an expert pilot is one who puts himself in a position that doesn't require his extreme skill to get out of or something like that. Right? He found himself in a situation, he's flying around at 260 knots, which is quite fast, at 1500 feet below the cloud base in an area he'd never been to before in the vicinity of a 10,000 foot mountain that he knew was there and didn't see. And then he used the area navigation system That's the nav select function we just mentioned. Then he used the area navigation system to find his way out, not knowing, of course, that it was going to take him through the hill. Now, you have to put those things together and say, would that be good airmanship? Air New Zealand said no. Yes, we screwed up on the flight path change, and yes, we screwed up not telling the pilots about whiteout. But Jim Collins still shouldn't have been misled. If he was going to fly visually, he had to be 100% certain of his position before descending. Thinking you are, and relying on your flight path, isn't good enough. You have to be positive. In closing, the Pilots' Union said basically the opposite to that. They said Jim Collins was absolutely entitled to do what he did and couldn't have been expected to pick up all of Air New Zealand's mistakes. He was misled right from the briefing, where he looked at the same flight plan as Les Simpson and concluded more or less the same thing that the flight path went west of Mount Erebus, rather than over the top of it. Paul Davison, who was actually the lawyer for the estate of Jim Collins, but was on the same side as the pilot's union, he said Collins almost certainly wrote all the coordinates down. Then, on the night before the flight, Jim Collins sat on the floor at home beside the dining room table and plotted his route. Two of his daughters, Catherine and Elizabeth, watched him do it. They even asked where he was going. They gave evidence at the commission and spoke on TV about it. Elizabeth and I were both interested to know where he was going to go the next day. We didn't know terribly much about this area. And he just, he said that he was going to come down the left-hand side here 
and as they'd fly it down this coast, they'd see the dry valleys on the right-hand side and then continue down the sound, and he didn't mention any of us. So, once Jim Collins got down to McMurdo Sound and got under that cloud, the deception was complete. They were flying into a whiteout that would hide the mountain in front of them. Paul Davison talked about something called the mental set here. This was the idea that the pilots looked at the bits of land they could see under the cloud and convinced themselves it was something else. Unfortunately, the two sides of Lewis Bay on the north coast of Ross Island looked vaguely similar to the two coasts of McMurdo Sound that they might have expected to see. And because they hadn't been to Antarctica before and they thought they were in the middle of McMurdo Sound, their eyes and brains told them that's what they were looking at. Essentially, it would have taken a huge amount of counterintuition for the pilots to flip all that on its head and say to themselves, no, we're not in McMurdo Sound. We're in Lewis Bay and we're heading straight for Mount Erebus. And so, Alpa said, because he had plotted his route the night before and because visibility was excellent when he started to descend, Jim Collins was perfectly entitled to take the plane down to 1,500 feet. This happened slowly. He started descending about 15 minutes before impact, did those two big 360s, and bottomed out at 1,500 feet, with about 90 seconds to go. And even then, with the flight path change and the whiteout working against him, Jim Collins sensed something was wrong. With 60 seconds to run, he said, actually, those conditions don't look very good at all, do they? 30 seconds later, flight engineer Gordon Brooks said, I don't like this. Almost straight away, Collins said, we're 26 miles north, we'll have to climb out of this. He and Casson spent the next 15 seconds discussing which way to turn. If they hadn't done that, if Collins had just decided to climb and done it immediately, they probably would have missed the mountain. The ground proximity warning system sounded six seconds before impact. The crew stayed calm. Flight engineer Brooks called out their altitude. 500 feet, 400 feet. In the final second, Jim Collins called for full power. Paul Davison closed his submission. The deception could not have been designed to be more total or absolute as that which led to this accident. With that, Peter Mann retired to write his report. It was January 1981. Three months later, in April, his son, Sam Mann, an artist who lived in a remote cottage in North Canterbury, got a phone call. My mother said that he was coming down. He had finished this great deal of work and he was coming down just for a break. He stayed at my cottage and it was very primitive. All I was doing was painting and hunting and fishing. That was it. One cold autumn evening, Sam and his father went duck shooting. Peter Mann's Erebus report, where he would declare who was to blame for the disaster, would be released to the public the next day. We stood there and it was windy, I remember, and the, the water was rough and the willows were bending and he lit a cigarette and he's staring out across the water and that's when he said, tomorrow all hell's going to break loose. I think the reaction was that this was a pretty stunning set of findings. I had sleepless nights thinking about it, I couldn't let it go. What we are going to do is get this thing tidy one way or another. That's next time on White Silence. White Silence is a co-production between Stuff and RNZ, written, produced and presented by Michael Wright and me, Katie Gossett. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ, and for Stuff, Carol Hirschfeld, Keith Lynch, John Hartevelt, Carmela Heyman and Adam Dudding also helped produce this podcast. This episode was engineered by Alex Harmer and included audio from Nga Taonga Sound and Vision, Archives New Zealand, Channel 9 and TVNZ through Getty Images. You can subscribe to the full six-part series at Apple, Spotify, Radio Public, Podbean and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to find details on how to subscribe. <laughs>